so my name is Yunus Balush and I'm coming from uh, Bucharest, Romania. I'm basically a software architect on the Java side. I'm working on financial trading systems in the training application field. Basically, today we are going to discuss about some sort of optimizations, some of them doing ahead of time, which is the case for LLVM, Clang, and uh, some of them are still based on GC2. Basically, this is our agenda for today. We are going to cover all of these topics and we'll uh, get into really deep under the hood. So it's very hardcore topic. We'll study a lot of things based on the assembly code. Why is that? Because there is no such way to do this kind of comparison between just-in-time compiler C2 and what Clang does uh, ahead of time. So I remind you up to now that it's still a lot of assembly. Nevertheless, I try to cut utmost as possible to be easier for this sort of short presentation to be also understandable. So I already kept the important parts in it. Basically, I'm a big fan of this guy, Richard Feynman. He won the Nobel Prize in physics. And he wrote a book, The Pleasure of Finding Things Out. So this is my mainly motivation. This is why I ended up in doing this kind of, because it's basically a research in between two different compilers, very, very different compilers, one ahead of time and one runtime. So part of the pleasure of finding things out, how the things are working under the hood, my perspective is that learning based on evidence and being driven by experiments is the best way to teach yourself and to prove yourself how the things are working under the hood. So basically the key points out of my presentation are the optimizations between just-in-time compiler and uh, Clang LLVM. And we'll study how powerful are these optimizations. When I say here powerful, I don't refer specific to timings. For me, timings are less important, especially because all the tests were done on my, on my box, on my laptop, basically. So if I have to rerun them on any other machine, there might be slightly different results. By powerful in here, I mean what kind of approaches, what are the tactics to end up with the best optimized code from both profiler perspective. So this is my main point of interest out of this talk. And basically, I don't want, I don't intend to have a battle between C++ because you can easily associate LLVM Clang with C++ and uh, C2 with Java. It's not my main interest and it's not fair to do that because these are only two uh, compilers. We cannot have conclusions at the end. One is better, one language is better than the other only by, based on these two, these two compilers. Uh, and why it might be a matter of interest, uh, just be for, because of performance, this is for sure. And also why I took Clang LLVM, because uh, it's, it's one of the best AUT compilers. Uh, and I don't think there is too much doubt in that. Uh, I, I know that a lot of projects in production uh, are still based on GCC, but still Clang LLVM, it's quite a wonderful compiler. And also Java, it's moving towards AOT. Uh, even if the support for AOT, it's quite limited at this stage and it was added in, in the latest release, it's, it's still experimental. And why did C2? Probably one, uh, some of you might have asked yourself, okay, GC2, it's not quite state of the art. I might agree with this approach as well, but still C2 is the most relevant compiler on the market. Imagine your, your projects. Most of our projects are still using hotspot C1, C2 in production systems. So that's, that's why for me it's still relevant, this kind of comparison to understand what types of optimizations. And zooming inside the world of optimization, it's very difficult to, to get to grab a few of them quite relevant. Because of course, as you can see here, are a huge, huge amount of optimizations. We can't speak all of this optimization and it's pointless to discuss all of them. That's why in my presentation I took only specific cases. I might be biased towards some specific cases. I'm, I'm basically a Java guy. I might be biased towards some powerful optimization in Java and to compare them uh, against Clang. Uh, but it's not my point in there. So I basically want to, to see what happens under the hood. Because also the, the compilation process is quite different. In Java, we have the bytecode, which is 
uh, compiled with Java C, and then uh, we we starts we kick off the JVM inside the interpreter, and the C2 uses the profiler, so it does a lot of speculative and aggressive optimizations under the hood, puts everything under some check conditions, uh, it goes into the optimization, re-optimization, and at the end it, it generates the native code, uh, which might be um, de-optimized and regenerate, uh, regenerated again and again. On the C clang, it's a bit different because it does everything ahead. It starts with the front end, it continues in the LLVM optimizer, and it generates the code, all of this ahead of time. So there is no runtime tuning from the Clang perspective. So that's why I was saying there are two very different perspectives, two different compilers, basically. In terms of test comparison, I was using quite a big bunch of software tools, apart uh, a the operating system, of course, I was using the latest JDK, I was using GMH, I was using JITWatch in some cases, I was using also PERF in some cases just to understand what really happens. For example, I profiled some hardware counters and I found it more, more, uh, more easier with PERF. And on the uh, C++ side, I was using LLVM Clang, the latest release. The benchmark for that was C++ Google and still um, a very good website, uh, godball.org, which generates the, the assembly code out of your C++ code. So it's quite useful, this, this kind of website. In terms of patterns, um, how I structure my presentation just before to dig in. Um, first, we'll study very, very trivial piece of, of Java, source code, very high level approach. Then we'll zoom in inside the JITC2, LLVM Clang generated code as well, some benchmark comparisons and some conclusions. And I can share with you some of the pitfalls of, the, of my methodology and the things that I learned based off of basically this research study. Um, it's not always easy to compare uh, these kind of approaches. It's not always apples to apples, and that, that's for sure. Why is that? Because we have different languages, different compilers. Most of them uh, have specifics, plus there are benchmark specifics. For example, in C++ Google Benchmark, we couldn't find a way, me and my colleague, uh, George, because I didn't uh, do all the, these things by, by myself, I did with my C++ colleague, George, uh, so we couldn't find a way to have under nanoseconds precision. Um, then uh, it's, it's not quite fair to run once um, the test on the single box and report. It should be comprehensive enough. More than that, uh, it's not fair as well to conclude Java versus C++ because I'm not quite interested in Java. I'm quite interested in the compiler's optimizations. So we can't conclude Java is better or C++ is better because of these results. There on the market, there are still another compilers that might beat, for example, Clang in, in some specific cases. And fast enough, it's fast enough. I really love this code for Cliff Kick. Uh, there is no interest in, in debating 2.5 nano seconds is better than two nanoseconds. Fast enough, it's fast enough. So in this case, uh, we will see during the presentation a lot of closer timings, uh, two dot something versus two. Fast enough in both cases. We don't care too much. And also, uh, just to get back to my aim is just to study some under the hood optimizations. And my advice for you is to focus a bit less on timing measurements. First case, it's about sequential sum of n LR, n LR elements. Sorry. So basically, in the in the source code, I have a trivial array um, which is initialized, and inside that hot method, which is annotated with the benchmark from the GMH, uh, I iterate through it and I, and I do the sum. As simple as that. In the the sequential sum inside the JITC2. Uh, how it looks like. Basically, uh, the, the, the top part, the one over there, some, some initializations, put them aside, and it starts with a scalar pre-loop. What it does in the scalar pre-loop, basically it tries to add one edge per cycle. It's basically in charge for, for some sort of alignments and caching. And afterwards, it goes down into the main scalar loop. Inside the main scalar loop, as we can see in here, there are eight additions per cycle. So basically, just in time, the C2 was able to unroll the, the main loop um, in, in, uh, to, and to add eight, 
integers per cycle. Uh, rolling is good because it minimizes the number of jump instructions. So that's why, reducing the number of, of jump instruction, we have those eight integers per cycle. And of course, there are cases where the size of n is not multiple by eight, for example, and there is still a scalar post loop which does one by one. So it's sort of remaining post loop. Uh, what Clang does, it's basically the same pattern in terms of unrolling the loops, but it's a very important difference because Clang in this case uh, uses vectorized operations. For example, you see the XMM reg registers. Uh, these are registers on 128 bits and they could store uh, four integers. So basically the LLVM Clang has a main loop vectorized, which it's still unrolled and does 32 integers per cycle because there are eight adds and each add it's tackling on uh, XMM register. So basically it does 32. It covers 32 uh, integers into the cycle. And if there is a remaining which is less than 32 but greater than 8, it has still a vectorized, po vectorized post loop which does 8 by 8. And still, there might be cases that the remaining it's not multiple of eight. And the last one is very similar with what we saw in Jitsi 2, and it does one by one until it reaches the, the size of n. So basically, if we have to refresh again our understanding up to this point, Jitsi 2 this has this pattern. So basically, it starts inside the scalar free loop, which goes one by one for, for alignment for caches, basically, it continues into the scalar main loop where it fits eight integers per cycle and is not vectorized, and it ends up with a scalar post loop. Nevertheless, uh, I don't advise you to take this pattern in quite serious because it's not quite relevant in all the cases. Uh, we'll study and we'll go into some other vectorized example for the JITC2, and they are slightly different, but particularly in this case, this is a pattern of, of unrolling the loop. And if we have to compare it with the LLVM Clang, what LLVM Clang does, it has a vectorized main loop which deals with 32 integers, vectorized post loop, the second one, and it ends up with all the remainings which are one by one until it reaches the, the size of n. In terms of benchmark comparison, of course, LLVM Clang beats JITS uh, C2 this time because it uses vectorization. So is, as we can see in here, for different sizes of metrics, uh, of arrays, um, we, we have better timings. Always it's better in LLVM Clang. It's around one order of magnitude. And the conclusions are in here. Basically, LLVM Clang is able to use vectorization in this case for both main and post loop, and the remaining it's done uh, one by one. Uh, on the other side, JITC2 specific in this case doesn't deal with vectorization. It does loop peeling, loop unrolling. Peeling is basically the first part of the main loop where um, it's, it's basically for alignment and CPU caches is the pre-loop. and still can't beat the LLVM clang. And I even went further a bit and I tried to, to understand, okay, what if I compile uh, on the clang side my array size with a predefined, for example, constant for the array size? In this case, it was 128. And in this case, it was surprisingly because what Clang does, it basically uh, unrolls everything. There is no any loop, any jump instruction, and it does all the, all the additions uh, still vectorized from, from the first one until the last one, 128. So basically, in this case, it's quite interesting remark because LLVM Clang decided to, to remove the jump instructions in spite of crashing the uh, increasing. So the instruction cache because instruction um, yeah instruction cache because instruction cache is not always uh, it's not always the first approach to increase it especially when we discuss about inlining and loop optimizations because we might end up in installs on the CPU side but nevertheless LAVM Clang decided to do that to remove all the jump instructions. But let's get back to Java, because we are basically Java guys attending this conference. And we saw that example when uh, Java 
didn't do any kind of vectorization. And I don't want to transmit this idea that just-in-time compiler is not able to do that. Of course it is. But there is a slightly kind of enhancement. <laughs> I would say it was uh, explicit disable for this kind of um, test case. Uh, why is that? Because cost of vectorization, um, it's, not, it's not a benefit in this case. So the, the, the Oracle guys decided to explicitly disable the vectorization. And also there is a wonderful blog post from the Richard Sartin, uh, especially on, on this topic. So probably it will be re-enabled re and refined in the future. And more than that, let's study some other cases. We just in time compiler this deals with loop vectorization um, because we didn't see up to this point any of them. And from this perspective, I was taking to, to some two arrays. Basically, it's again very trivial example. I define two, two arrays, and at the bottom in the benchmark method, I just iterate and C equals A plus B. Extremely simple. And in this case, and when I profiled, uh, just-in-time compiler was able to do vectorization and was able even to do using YMM registers, not XMM registers, because the support for vectorization was extremely improved in, in JDK 9. So basically, in this case, what JIT, uh, JIT C2 does for the main loop, because there is also a pre- and post-vectorized loop, uh, it was able to do 32 integers per cycle, as, as you would say in there. So basically, there are eight uh, eight ad operation across uh, uh, eight uh, four sorry uh, operations ad operations across eight integers so basically th uh, across eight registers basically 32 reg uh, integers uh, and another case where uh, it does vectorization and it does it really well is if you have a constant and if you have an array and you want, for example, to add that constant to all the elements array. Basically, as we can see on, on the bottom uh, part of the screen, uh, I have a constant and I add it to each element of the array. And in this case, it's even surprisingly good because uh, it was able to do 64 integers per loop cycle. There are eight add operations using uh, spread across eight YII, uh, YMM registers, so basically eight multiplied by, by eight. So if you get back and summarize again the pattern for this loop vectorization, uh, that's why I was saying to not take quite serious the first uh, template. Uh, this one, it's, it's relevant especially for JDK 9, because in JDK 9, uh, we have this pattern of scalar free loop, um, and then it goes into vectorized main loop. And inside the vectorized main loop, in my case, uh, there were tackled 64 integers. If the remaining it's still less than 64 but bigger than 8, it goes and it does the vectorized post loop, 8 by 8, and still the remaining, the remaining 1 by 1 into the scalar post loop. In terms of comparison, it's nothing surprisingly. JITC2, it's almost the same as LLVM Clang. So I conclude in, in this, it's no performance difference at all. The next example is about sequential sum of n integers. Basically, it's quite, um, uh, as the title sounds, it's quite easy. So I have a loop and I do the from 1 to n, and I add all of these numbers. Uh, in case of JIT C2, what would happen? The same, we, we start with the same scalar pre loop. It does one by one, few cycles, and then it continues and it's able to unroll and to do 16 additions per cycle. So basically, it does 16, the next 16, the next 16, and so on, until a step where it doesn't fit and it continues with the remaining part still one by one inside the scalar post loop where it does one addition per cycle at a time. So as you can see in here, he, he still uses the same pattern. Uh, in comparison with Clang, Clang, um, it's, it's quite powerful in this case, and the optimization in Clang world, it's called induction variable optimization. So it's able to figure out that, okay, there is a variable which is incremented by a constant, for example, stride and so on, um, and it falls down everything by this reduction formula. So basically, LLVM Clang was able to do this kind of, victory, uh, of um, reduction. 
In terms of comparison, nothing is surprisingly because Clang is almost constant. And it's not dependent on N, of course, because it still reads the N from, it, it copies into a register and does the, the reduction formula. In comparison, GC2 depends on N size. So bigger the N you have, less performance, um, less throughput you have, or, or uh, lower, uh, bigger response time you have during the runtime. And which is quite, quite um, a bit uh, questionable because you might end up with the question, okay, but what happens for GC2? Why it's not able to do this kind of optimization? And it's a fair question. I would also ask myself the same. And the reality is this one. Hypothetically, JIT can do that. The reality is a bit different because in reality it would need more advanced loop analysis. Uh, so uh, basically what happens in LLVM with that kind of uh, loop induction variable, the optimization is called scalar evolution and loop optimization which uses the loop induction variable. Uh, it's based and at the moment JIT is not, uh, this kind of optimization it's not happening in JIT to my knowledge. So basically it's, it, uh, to my knowledge, it's not happening, and I couldn't find a way to, to make it happen in, in my tests. Um, then the next case is about field layout. Uh, and what I would want to, to spot in here, um, three cases. Basically, the first case, uh, it's based on, on vanilla comparison between a class and a struct. Uh, in case of um, vanilla, uh, let's say in, in uh, Java we have a class with two shorts in it, and we have uh, the same, quite similar uh, struct with X and Y. So basically uh, what happens, the, the layout, it's uh, from the Java side, it's on the, the right top. We have the header. The header in my case, it's 12 bytes because I was using with compress hoops, uh, and I was using on 64 uh, bit. So basically we have the header 12. And in case of tracks, there is no header. So basically the footprint is four bytes. And if we have to get and make an analogy with the, the CPU cache, what is my CPU cache? Basically on my machine it's 32 for L1D cache. And it has the length on 64 bytes. Basically, uh, one cache line is 64 bytes. So the question is, how many objects fill inside one cache line? So in case of Java, uh, it has 60 bytes, um, 16 bytes. Sorry, it it uh, it fits four instances, and in case of uh, structs, there are 16, which is quite a, an important difference because imagine, for example, if all of these are laid out into a contiguous array of, um, of memory, once you hit the first one, you will have the next ones aligned into the, the L1 CPU cache. So basically, I, I tested this with a quite trivial um, program. I created an array of uh, explicitly size of, of 2K, 2048. Why is that? I, I just wanted to fit my L1 case size. And in terms of comparison, uh, the things were better in terms of Clang. But this is not specific to Clang itself. It's, it's the way uh, the, the memory, its layout, and the, the overhead of the objects. So basically, why we have a better uh, time in LLVM Clang uh, side? Because there were more CPU cache misses for, for the objects in Java, because they were bigger and the, the header occupied some of the cache size. The next one, it's in terms of padding. So basically, I took two, um, one, uh, the struct padding, I uh, took two examples with paddings. First one, it's equivalent to the second one. And why is that? Because uh, as you see, the first one declares X, a bunch of longs, eight longs. Why are eight longs? Just to cover the, the CPU cache line, 64 bytes, and we end up with Y. So basically, um, what happens in Java, Java reorders fields, so we have the layout on, on the right top in there. So X and Y are layout one next to each other. And then it continues with all the longs. And, and uh, of course, starting with the header, in total we have 80 bytes for, for the class padding. For the struct, what we have, um, 
um, automatically, uh, C++ doesn't do any fields reordering. It just adds padding for, for the memory alignment stuff. And we have X and Y, as they are declared by the, by the programmer. We have the padding in between Y and L0, padding of four bytes. And L0 starts uh, fro from the eighth uh, address. And it lays out all the longs until it reaches 72 bytes. So basically, still the padding, it's, it's a bit less than, than the class in Java. And if we get back to the same L1 CPU cache, uh, how many objects fit in one? It's basically uh, one, one CPU cache line, basically one. On, on these two, but the, there is one important difference. In this case, both X and Y are falling on the same CPU cache line. Why it's important? Because while accessing X, I have already lay out in, in the same lay, uh, cache line the Y. So basically, I minimize the number of misses after uh, I, I request X because Y is already there. So the test case was quite similar to the first, and the timings almost there. So no quite big difference in timings because I especially designed the test case to have X and Y in the same cache line and to have almost almost the same number of, of CPU cache misses. The third case, it's about um, because we saw the reordering of the fields. And I don't want Java to reorder my fields. So I was a bit quite annoyed in the first annoyed in quote. Uh, in the first case, uh, I, so this time I really don't want to do that. Our many options for doing that. You can use also the contended annotation, but I didn't use that, so I used uh, a subclassing um, strategy. For example, I decided to extend my best class into the hierarchy class. So in this case, uh, fields from the subclass are not reordered with the fields from the base class. And the layout on, on top right is like that one. Still the header, it's X, the first field from, from the 12, and uh, there is a padding. It's padding because also the fields are aligned. Uh, the fields inside the class are typed aligned. For example, if, if the field is it's, it's long, it should be aligned at 8. And then are aligned the old, uh, the old, sorry, uh, long fields, and at the end it's Y. And still we have the padding because the, the footprint of the object cannot fit, uh, cannot end, at, uh, cannot have 82, for example. So it should be aligned as well. So there is still a padding and ends in 88 bytes. In case of struct, we don't have um, any, of course, still no, no reordering, as we discussed, but still there are two paddings in between X and L0, and after Y, um, still one padding, just to, to not mess up the, the alignment for that object. CPU caches, uh, basically the same stuff, um, one object from, from uh, Java, one struct, but this is a slightly big, uh, bigger difference because in this case, X and Y doesn't fit the same cache line. As we can see here, X and Y are quite sparse, so basically they don't fit inside the same cache. And the test on my side was basically the same, still creating an array, iterating through it, and in terms of, of performance, quite the same. Because still we, we had misses um, while accessing basically Y, uh, the Y field, but uh, I try to compensate the ones from, from class with the ones from struct, so basically I try to, to, uh, to, to be closer enough. So there's not quite a, a, a relevant performance also in this case. So basically the conclusions are, apart the header uh, that we saw uh, in, in Java, the, the header of the object, in that case, um, uh, the, the, struct, uh, the footprint of the struct was basically smaller, which is good for the CPU caches. Nevertheless, Java does fields reordering, which might be good or bad, depending on the context, and we'll discuss a bit about this kind of two cases. And in terms of Clang, uh, it doesn't do fields reordering, it just adds padding, um, which also might hurt performance when your fields are very, very inefficient layout in a struct uh, from, from the accesses perspective. 
And the question that we, I want to zoom in a bit is, what are the cases when fields reordering are good or not good? Because basically, uh, Java does fields reordering. So first of all, they are useful because they improve the overall size of the object. The footprint of the object, it's, it's smaller, and more object fits inside the CPU cache. Uh, and it prevents as well some, some misalignment, so everything is uh, it's aligned. As I was saying, the fields are type aligned and the objects are 8 byte aligned. Um, and here it's, it's the, the, basically the important stuff. Reordering fields, uh, as, as we saw, X, some, some longs, and Y. Reordering those, putting X next to Y, might be good in the situations where you have, for example, access, you have access for X, you have access for Y. Once you access Y, there is already in the CPU cache line. But if you have any other kind of reorderings, for example, when you have X and Y, you may end up as well in false sharing pattern. What is false sharing? Basically, X and Y are laid out on the same cache line. There are multiple threads. At least one thread is the writer. This is the pattern for false sharing. At least one thread is the writer. And you have concurrent access between those X and Y fields with a high frequency. Because if you don't have high frequency, there is still false sharing, but you don't notice it. So basically, um, you may end up in this kind of false sharing pattern, and we need to pay careful of this kind of situation. And more than that, also, regrouping fields might be problematic on the other part because, for example, it might regroup fields. So basically, the fields that I was declaring one next to each other in, in my Java code program, they might be reordered on the diff and fall on the different cache lines, so increases the number of CPU misses. So these are all the things that I want to, to cover and remind you because fields reordering are good as, as, uh, as soon as we are conscious about the, the hardware implications on them. Null checks. Um, so the null checks is the next example. Basically, um, we have a method which receives an integer, and it returns that integer if it is not null multiplied by 42, otherwise returns 0. Basically, in case of JITC2, what it does, um, you can see um, even if in the Java code there is an explicit null check, in the assembly code, there was no null check because it relies on the assumption that during the runtime, uh, there was no null value for the method. So basically, it inlines and make this assumption. And in case uh, that there are no nulls, but in case there are nulls, of course, there is an implicit handler. And that handler calls the, the uncommon trap, basically. Uh, and it goes into, for example, it's exactly like in C++. Plus, uh, segmentation fault happens. The signal is called the JVM. The JVM uh, has an afterthought, and it uh, deoptimizes and re probably recompile again. So basically, in this kinds of optimization, JVM uses some common trap to tackle, to make optimistic assumptions. In LLVM Clank, it doesn't do that. This is also uh, because uh, in the source code, there was an implicit null check. So basically, what LLVM does, it explicitly tests the value. You, you see there, test AX, test um, error AX, sorry. And if it is 0, it returns 0. It's the last sort. Otherwise, it multiplies 42 with the, the value and returns the result. So there is no explicit null check. In terms of comparison, of course, no big difference. It's, it's just, uh, just one, one check. And in modern hardware, if, if that check doesn't end into a, a stall, it, you, you won't notify a big impact during the runtime. So basically, I conclude there is no difference at all in performance. Fast enough is fast enough in this case. So, the conclusion are like LLVM clad added an explicit null check, but um, JITC2 decided to do this kind of optimization to add the uncommon trap, uh, relying on the fact there are no nulls during the runtime. But the question is, what happens if my method is called with null and null null values? In this case, the same method tested again calling it with not null values as well. And it's the, uh, the, the code um, generated by C2. It's exactly like the one as Clang. So basically, there is an explicit null check in this case. 
And as you can see, not any uncommon trap. So I would say JIT fall back to the classic way of handling nodes, very similar to what Clang did. In terms of comparison, still no big difference. But the question is, uh, why and in which context are these uh, kind of optimizations good? Because my benchmark didn't spot too much. Basically, there are some contexts where you might benefit out of these optimizations, especially like this, when you have a huge number of well-predicted branches in your code. So basically, you reach the, the harder predictor limit. It couldn't, couldn't guess anymore. Sorry. Yep. So it couldn't guess anymore, so you reach the hardware limitation, and up to that point, you might see a significant difference between these two approaches. But up to that certain point, I also tested with um, a lot of null checks, and at least on my CPU, I didn't see noticeable difference in performance. Local lesion, it's the next one. What it says, basically, I have a method and I foolishly added a bunch of synchronized um, blocks, and inside each synchronized block, I just did some sums. It's a foolish implementation, of course. You, you, won't, uh, do, you never do that in, in any real code, um, because each, each method is allocated to the stack frame, so it's basically thread safe. There is no meaning to, do like, to write such code. But nevertheless, I tried to, to test it with uh, C2, and what C2 did, it, re it completely removed any synchronized operation. So basically, as we can see here, there is the sequential sum, no locks in between. In case of Clang, um, at this stage, um, he is not able to, to spot that in advance. So basically, it still did nine useless lock uh, blocks. And in the, the tenth one, it did all the, um, for example, all the computations. Uh, in terms of, of performance, of course, because of the synchronization, it's still in there, Clang uh, behave. Uh, not so efficient like C2. Uh, C2, I would say, it's, it's almost constant um, if, if the number of computation inside that synchronized box are, are, uh, blocks are quite easy. For example, I had only additions, which are quite fast. But if you add more and more synchronized, foolish synchronized block in, in the C++ code, Clank is not able to get rid of them. Um, so basically, in this case, what, what mattered a lot in, in Java were, were the, the very well-defined uh, built-in synchronized semantics at the, the language level. Uh, in, in Clang, at this stage, I couldn't find any way. And I also did another test with lock versioning. If I have time, I will show it to you. Um, so in case of lock versioning, it behaves the same. Clang is not able to remove, uh, to remove useless locks and to coercion uh, the, the, the blocks to remove the synchronization blocks. So it's, it's very similar like in this one where JIT uh, C2 still it's, it's better. Uh, another case is the case for virtual calls. Uh, in, it's a, a case where, for example, I took a base class like you see there, top right. Uh, there, it has a shape and it has a first implementation which is called triangle. Uh, so basically what I did, I created an instance of, of that and I call compute method. What I do in the compute method, I basically do a multiplication between the parameter and a constant. The constant in this case was 17 over there. So basically the code generated by C2 was this one, very straightforward, no more virtual table, lookup, nothing like that, just an inlining, free assemble instructions. So basically it was able to spot out during the runtime, okay, there is, there is still one instance. Uh, so let's inline everything. So this case of, of single target invocation are basically not monomorphic calls and um, as we can spot in there, there is no uncommon trap added. In comparison uh, with Clang, Clang was basically uh, still ahead of time, uh, spot this scenario, and it did um, still inlining bypassing the cost of the table lookup. So basically, it's, it's almost no difference in performance at all. <laughs> 
For the next example, I added another implementation for my shape, and uh, in, it's called a rectangular in this case, and the compute method, uh, what it does, basically the sum of two, and the second, the rectangle, multiplies the constant by 19. It's just a, a, a constant. So in this case, what uh, C2 did, it's basically, um, he thought, okay, there, are, uh, there, there is another implementation, let's test it explicitly. So if there is one instance of, of rectangle, as you can see there, top, let's jump and do the, the L0, right? So in L0, it multiplies that one by, um, by 19. If there is triangle, yes, if there is triangle, let's do the other type of computation. And if there is some other third or possible fourth implementation, let's hit again the uncommon trap because there might be other implementations that might uh, be used to call the method. So basically, in this case of, of uh, two, two targets, bimorphic calls, in this case, both of them were in line, no, no any uncommon trap. Um, LLVM Clang, what it did, um, Again, uh, it spot out this pattern and it inline everything. No any uncommon, uh, no any uh, V table call, no any V table lookup. So as you can see here, everything gets aligned. In terms of comparison, bimorphic calls it's slightly bigger uh, because there is a test conditions and of the things around the clank. It's basically constant in time. The third case is where you, for example, add another implementation, let's say square implementation, and uh, you do three additions as, as it is written in, in the bottom of the slide here. So you have compute plus compute plus compute, three different instances. And the third one, what does it multiplies uh, the parameter by, by 23? In this case, GC2 doesn't do any sort of optimization uh, like inlining. Uh, it just does the real v v virtual call during the runtime. So nothing gets in line, no any uncommon trap. In case of LLVM Clank, he was still able to spot out this. So he did the inlining, and as you can see here, there is no virtual call. Even if in, in the source code there was a, a v, v call. The megamorphic calls are even slower, so I end up around 1.8 something nanoseconds in comparison to almost closer to 2 nanoseconds. As I was saying in the beginning, I couldn't find a way for the C++ Guggen benchmark to have less than nanoseconds precision, so I think it's closer to 2 nanoseconds, around 2 nanoseconds. The conclusions based on, on this test case is that um, specific in this case, I don't want to give you the impression that there are no virt virtual calls during the runtime, but specific in, in this test case, there were no VTable lookups anymore uh, for, for the Clang. However, I took the same piece of the code and I compiled with, um, yeah, I compiled it with um, GCC, and that one uh, was able to do the VTable lookups. But Clank didn't. Clank uh, was able to do this kind of optimization. In case of C2, the monomorphic and bimorphic calls were, were, were optimized, but starting with the third implementation, it wasn't able to do that. This context of testing where you have, for example, one type profiler and you change the context from one caller to another, it's called polluted profiler. And basically, in this case um, of polluted profilers, there is no any split profiler created. So basically there is this uh, ticket number to create contents dependent split profilers to be able to, to get, uh, uh, for example, if a method is in line three times, it should get three fresh copies. So at this stage it's not possible, so that's why we ended up with it's still the, the, the virtual call. The scalar replacement, it's the next one. So in terms of scalar replacement, uh, what I have did, um, I've created inside the hot method uh, one instance, uh, and I've returned x plus y. It's, again, something a bit foolish, because why I should create an instance for nothing to do the, the addition afterwards. 
But nevertheless, I just wanted to test this. And uh, in, in GC2, as we can see here, there is no allocation. It's just an addition between X and Y. So basically, this type of optimization, which is called scala replacement, um, it's enabled in, in the hotspot using escape analysis. Uh, this type of optimizations was able to get rid of any stack allocations, based, of course, based on, on the, the uh, scope of that object. And in case of LLVM clan, um, still the same. He didn't, alloc he didn't allocate anymore any heap. And in this case, um, the, the, as you can see there, there is just an addition at the end. So basically, uh, it, it reduced the, the, the footprint of, of the heap. In terms of benchmark comparisons, almost the same difference. So fast enough, it's fast enough. I, I can't conclude based on this test case one it's better. So basically, in, in this particular, particular case, both of the, the compilers were able to, to preserve basically the heap allocation by replacing, exploding the, the fields um, on the stack and did the, the sum and return the sum. So a few conclusions at the end of my talk. Um, basically, um, now if I have to think um, across what uh, me and George did, uh, we find out Clang a very, very smart uh, compiler. So it still did a lot of powerful optimization. Now I can agree that probably there might be some ways to trick the C++ code to foolish be the, the, uh, the Clang compiler, but we didn't do a very, very, uh, a lot of tricks in the C++ code. But probably it is, it is very sensitive uh, way of tricking the LLVM uh, C Clang compiler as well. Based on our test cases, we nevertheless, we spotted out that it, it's still clever. It still da uh, did a lot of powerful optimization, even in this ahead of, of time appro approach. Uh, C2, still it's good. Uh, it, it was able to do a lot of powerful optimizations. Um, especially, it puts a lot of effort in that profiling information during the runtime. And it was, in, in my particular case, with uh, lock elision and also lock versioning, it was able to to reuse the, the very well-built-in synchronized semantics. So it was able to spot the and to remove the uh, useless synchronized block. And nevertheless, the, the, the thing is that when both of them are doing basically optimizations using the same patterns like unrolling, like um, vectorizations, there is no quite a big performance uh, at all, at least uh, during our, our test cases. So we couldn't spot the biggest difference in performance. So in, in closing of this talk, uh, I also end up again with a Richard Feynman quote, which said that it doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't make a difference how smart you are. Who made that guess? If you don't have a good experiment to prove what you are trying to demonstrate by conclusions, it's meaningless. That's why I presented you a lot of test cases that me and George did. And based on all of these test cases, I proved with some code under the hood generated the, those optimizations, what it really happens under the hood. So special thanks to George who worked with me on, on these test uh, cases. And also I'd like to thank you all for attending these sessions. So thank you for your talk. Uh, how can LLVM eliminate the virtual call if the different implementations are not in one um, compilation unit? 
Uh, yeah, this is an interesting uh, case. Uh, so basically, I tested with the, in the same compilation unit. Um, a good, a good and interesting case would be because, for example, Java still does cross-component. Um, for example, you, uh, with the modularization, you can have multiple uh, implementations, different packages, and st Java still can does the inlining. Uh, the test case that uh, we didn't do, and it's on our to-do list, it's exactly like this. So having basically like triangle, rectangle, and a square in different shared objects, and to see them. I don't think it will be, but I, I couldn't conclude because we haven't tested this scenario. Basically, all of them were on, on the same compilation unit. And the second question about the field layout. So your test had an array of objects, right? So I think the problem is not the layout of the fields, but that in Java, you have references to your objects. And the pointer chasing is the problem, because in the array, you have only the references. So it's not densely laid out like in a C++ case. Yes, exactly. So basically, yes, exactly. So basically, in Java, you have pointers from the array to the objects. But in C++, we have everything in structs compacted. So the, the performance difference is mostly yes. because of the pointers, not because of in, the layout. In, yeah. In this case, um, basically, if I would have to, to go even further and to do the test from another perspective, I will create, I will allocate the, the object with malloc to still have the, the, the metadata and the V table overhead also on the C++ side. So, yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm from Azul, and we have a JIT compiler based on LVM. And you can download and experiment it to see basically a little bit of put two worlds, JIT compiler, but yet LVM backend. For example, we do a vectorization in, in our JIT compiler the same way as you showed in LVM code base. But we don't get any credit for it whatsoever because Intel did all that. And actually, Intel did both in C2 vectorization, as it exists today, and in LVM backend. So it's, it's actually Intel on both sides. Um, so yeah, and for, for those who are here, uh, there will be a talk by my colleague at 2 o'clock uh, talking about the LVM-based JIT. Yeah, thanks, thanks for this. Just to, to, as I said in the beginning, probably uh, JIT-C2, it's not quite a state-of-the-art compiler anymore, but it's still the most one. And uh, for example, uh, we saw during this uh, conference a lot of Graal. So basically, Graal, it's, it's moving towards quite fast. Uh, the, the Falcon compiler, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? No? Anyway, if you find some other questions, you might chase me inside the conference on the speakers uh, place, discussions place. So if there are no any other questions, thanks a lot for, for the attendance today. Thank you. Thank you.